Hi everyone, welcome to Unapologetically You with myself Tuls and the wonderful Kelly. So today oh. we are on part two of our three part series, basically talking about the topic of self-sabotage. Now last time it was super interesting, me and Kelly were talking about breaking promises to ourselves, how we can dwell on mistakes or mishaps and how we may struggle to set boundaries. So if you haven't already checked that one out, the link is in the description box below. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell because we would love to have you part of our community so you know when the next episode is out. And we're also on Spotify. So yeah, there's a lot to, to, uh, to take in. There's a lot in the description below. And I'm going to talk, um, well, we are going to talk about in part two, about the self-critical voice, about procrastination, and mm -hmm. about imposter syndrome. So these are really cool topics. Cal, hi, how are you? I'm good. Perfect introduction as it ever tells. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good. Good. Um, yeah, imposter syndrome. No, what was our first one? <laughs> what was our first topic? You said? We can start with imposter syndrome. Let's let's start with imposter syndrome. Yeah, it's pretty rampant, isn't it? And maybe that's why I said it first because I feel like there are many times that I've felt it, yeah. or. Uh, yeah, I guess I've just felt it. No one else has put the pressure on me to be something that I'm not, but I haven't felt like I could live up to their expectations or their versions of me. And so, yeah, you get that sort of imposter syndrome feeling going on. What about you? Well, I want to I want to kind of like hang on to that little thread that you just said right now. So you said that nobody's put any pressure or expectation on you to perform in a certain way right perform um your characteristic your personality um, or anything beyond what I can do or have done you know okay. nothing beyond that but then but. when you talk about you putting the self-imposed imposter syndrome upon yourself and nobody else yep where has that come from because we can we can chalk it down to maybe it's society maybe it's our peers maybe it's a female thing but when did you actually think I've got to I don't feel comfortable in this environment and when did that change especially in a sporting environment right 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 and there's a lot of faux confidence in sport would you say that too yeah men and women yeah Men and women. Men might have a better way of covering it up or that bravado or something or it's just a bit of their personality that they don't show it. But women do sort of withdraw or don't, maybe the opposite of withdraw, they just don't expand themselves into the space that they are, that they have available to feel. They withdraw away from their space right so 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 what, where was I going with that Tulsa I think I say this every week I start something then I go where was I going with that I do you're laughing at me because I do you were saying about playing well playing small essentially oh sport yeah I was just saying in sport yeah it's pretty rampant um yeah definitely in sport and I think you've pro probably experienced that as well like your own position in the sporting environment. I am so used to, I was so used to playing small um, and I took the role of not filling space or how little space do I mm -hmm. hold up in this environment? Mm -hmm. Even when I was coaching, you know, how how can I be unseen? How can I be an, an invisible? And I'm not sure whether there was the narrative of coaching of you should be in the shadows, you're the background staff, you're not important kind of thing, but you are. But I also <laughs> feel like that also stemmed from my lack of confidence as a person. And I'm not mm -hmm. that person anymore. But you know me, Cal, I love my research. And I wanted to bring a few bits of uh, uh, things that I've found out online. And there's a psychologist 
who is called Pauline Rose and there's another called Suzanne Eines. I, I feel like I'm maybe butchering her last name, but they <laughs> said that the development of the originally termed imposter phenomenon was in the 1978 study and they focused on high achieving women. So they poised that despite outstanding academic and professional accomplishments, women who experience the imposter phenomenon persist in believing that they're not bright and they fooled everyone who thinks otherwise. And their findings had spurred decades of thought on leadership programs, initiatives to address imposter syndrome in women. But the thing is, something that's less explored is why imposter syndrome is exclusively fostered and exacerbated just within the female population. Just as you said, with men in sport, it, it doesn't stem imposter syndrome in that regard. But why is it that women distrust their own positions and as a consequence, their hard earned success? Are you asking me the answer? Because I don't know. It's, there's something we can talk about and, and try to whittle down. Tolls, I, I do think there are men who struggle, suffer, have imposter syndrome. Yeah. I definitely do. And I also uh, was speaking one time to the parent of one of the athletes I coach. Mm-hmm. And she said she worried for her son. She worried a lot because the, he was – and it was fairly recently. So he was growing up in an environment where women were becoming more empowered by men who would put the spotlight on them, but also by women who were courageous enough to step up and put themselves in the spotlight. And then there are opportunities in workplaces where in Australia, at least, we have to have at least one woman on an, a board, yeah. on every board. Um, you know, some jobs are filling a gender requirement and this made it very hard for him to get a job it actually did it made him it it really he struggled mentally with it hugely so um you know these roles that he would have equal opportunity for in another period of time he had no opportunity for in this period of time Okay. So that really affected him and it affected his mum um, hugely as well. So, yeah, he started feeling like, you know, women were stepping up mm. and wrecking his chances. <laughs> um, and so he he didn't think, well, he was getting quite agitated about it, quite aggrieved that, you know, women who didn't necessarily or didn't give the impression that they could do the job. So they had imposter syndrome. They they felt like imposters but still had the right to sit on a board. They still had the right to go for a job that was um, not available to him. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I can. No, it really, yeah. really does. And, and what you're saying actually makes me understand that positions such as marketing, commercial, HR, they are female dominant, right? They tend to be female dominant. So if we're looking at a male who is applying for a role, and obviously we're trying to remain gender neutral because obviously it could be um, a vast array of how people define who they are. So this is just in simple terms. So we don't want to offend anybody at this point. But um, if, if he or she does apply for a position, and they don't feel comfortable in that environment because they feel that they are outnumbered. But actually, if I if I go back to what the psychologist had said with that earlier study, the, the thing is, when, when women had started entering the workplace, we were told as a collective, you're only here temporarily you're not you don't belong right so women were ushered in in the wartime to fill positions because men needed to be on the front line right so what ended up happening is women would take up some of the factory roles and the things that they needed to do and even they would go out into the battlefield where they were required because there was a lack of numbers 
for whichever country they were fighting for. So the thing is, as soon as the men had come back from war, the women would then be put back into the household duties. Like they would have to obviously merge between the two roles anyway. But once the war was over, right back to your position. So if I take that whole era of where it actually evolved for women in the workplace, that there are microaggressions, there is expectations, there are assumptions by stereotypes, by racism. And those are the things that have kind of evolved through the decades of we're trying to still find our own place and feel where we need to belong. And that mm-hmm. could I, I easily be identified with um, somebody else who feels the same way in a specific environment. So I, I do understand where you're coming from. Yeah, which makes me think about periods of time in history like the wars, you know, um, would women have the same roles they do now without those periods of dreadful times in history? Because we, we as a gender, were not necessarily um, making grenades mm. in, um, in factories. Um, and then when you say the, the men came back from the front line and the women were then relegated back to domestic duties, um, and the opportunity was taken away from them. But um, I, and I know it doesn't really sound like making a grenade in a factory is an opportunity, but, um, you know, that that was taken away from them. And if that had never happened and they never had that opportunity, would we have, would we have the jobs we have now, Tos? I don't know. And, th- and this is the thing, it's... <laughs> Well, you and I both believe in everything happens in order and we end up coming to the right place at the right time. Like we believe in you believe that. The, yeah. the order of the universe kind of thing. I don't feel like we are out of control. I feel like we still need to make decisions and action those things to mm. progress our future and our and towards our goals. But generally speaking, if you're looking at if they, that didn't happen, where would we be today? I, I reckon it would be backwards. I feel like the the Me too. Time. we'd be behind, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in between the time of working in, um, we'll stay with the example of making a grenade in a factory, where um, there would have been a level of a high level of responsibility, surely, yeah, yeah? yeah. Um, to having imposter syndrome, because I think if you had been plucked out of um, home and put into a factory to make a grenade you would you would not have you would have known you had to do it you would not have thought you couldn't do it or you would have been shown how to do it and you go okay now I can do it okay so you are now a woman working in a factory making a grenade that has to be I imagine pretty specifically made to a very specific little recipe inside it I guess and um and you would not have thought that you couldn't do it you would not have had imposter syndrome would you no. So how how did we get to the point where now we have jobs with similar levels of responsibility or the same, same levels of responsibility that um, would be, you know, you, you would look at, you would manage a group of people. And, and I know that is the case because in Australia, my grandma made uh, bombs in a factory in Sydney and she managed a line. She managed a downline of people. Okay, so she was a mum. Actually, she wasn't even a mum. She was a teenager. My goodness. She was a young, or maybe she was a wife, a young wife who um, was taken from the home into a factory managing people that she'd never done. She'd never had a job, really. I think she worked in a bakery. She was a shop girl in a bakery. And then she went into that. She never thought she couldn't do it. She didn't? No. No, she never thought she couldn't do it. But then when she was taken out of it, did she, did, how did we get from her being this magnificent woman in war times when you needed to be a certain kind of person and she was that sort of certain kind of person two generations later, is that three generations later, to me who and get sent job applications and said, would you be interested in 
interested in applying for that. And I look at every single um, qualification and experience that you did and go, don't think I could do it. Really? Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, Kat, I, I, sorry, what were you going to say? Nothing. I'm listening. Go. No, because I, I find that really interesting. But taking a few steps back, right? Did you actually ask your grandma whether she felt that she didn't belong? No, and I would never have asked. It wouldn't have entered my head to ask that. But when she told the story, she did not seem like she was nervous about it. She wasn't scared about it. She never said, I can't do that. She went, okay, this is what I do now. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was no, I mean, imposter syndrome didn't exist then as a word or as a term that's true so maybe she felt overwhelmed but did it and so if she felt overwhelmed but did it is that what we're feeling but we're calling it imposter syndrome do we feel overwhelmed but can do it anyway or should be able to do it anyway what do you think I love that I love the fact that you whistled it down to it feels overwhelming and it's been catastrophized into these two words but the thing is going back to your grandma Mm -hmm. if she did and and this is just collectively if they did end up making bombs and going into a factory where they've had to do things systematically who were they environ who were they um surrounded by it wouldn't have been men at that point because they would have been at the front line so actually the imposter syndrome wouldn't would not have existed as a terminology anyway but the thing is as a collective, they would have been other women who have come from households who were unsure of how to do that competently until they were shown how, and they just got on with it, right? So it's almost Mm -hmm. like it's, it's overcoming the fear of the unknown and doing it anyway. But the thing is, when I was listening to Brené Brown's podcast, I found it really interesting because they said that it, it, it was, it was, the wrong way of describing imposter syndrome that it's it's they actually came up with a t- with the um article in Harvard Business Review of stop telling women they have imposter syndrome which I was like oh okay well that's interesting let's let's read the article and find out a little bit more about it but these two phenomenal women who had written the article had basically said that the the need to belong in groups, in clubs, in societies, in corporations, it was from men. So institutions, corporations uh, were designed to be a boys club and they nurtured white supremacy. So employees who aren't able to conform to that male biased societal styles are told where you've got imposter syndrome. And it's almost like a humble brag to say, I feel like an imposter, right? Because it's like, oh, yeah, I feel like an imposter, of course. Yeah. But in reality, we're confirming that our caste, our generation, our gender don't belong to something that was created by men. So there was this psychologist called Thomas. um, I'm not even going to pronounce his last name. I'll put it in the description (laughs) for our audience who want to look up his research. But he said, that the arrogance, the overconfidence is invertly related to leadership talent, right? There's a lot of women who don't class themselves as leaders, but their ability to build, maintain high performing teams, inspire followers, uh, and inspire their you know, employees. So they can look at the overall common interest of the group, but that whole system rewards males. So they reward male leaders. So they told, you know, even if they're incompetent or they punish white women for lacking confidence, women of color showing too much of it and all women for demonstrating in a way that's deemed unacceptable. It's almost like, what are you doing? You're trying to be something you're not. And that's where I feel like imposter syndrome has evolved because we're told, oh, you feel imposter syndrome or you should right yeah well yeah because the culture does not suit our temperament or our reward system you do feel like an imposter in that environment anyway don't you okay all right 
So what else did that article say? Because you were talking, we were talking about it before, but I haven't read it yet. So that was really interesting. I feel like that was just the overall gist of it. It stops saying that women have imposter syndrome because it's it's just like leaders have to create a culture for women and pe- people of color and address that bias or racism. Um, and then that's where they they delved a little bit deep. But I think they've got another article coming out as well. So they they did their first article a couple of years ago. So they've got another article coming out. And and if it's if it is before we air our podcast then I'll, I'll pop it in the link below but I feel like it's going back to when I explained earlier about what the type of leadership qualities you should have are associated with male characteristics well the thing mm-hmm. is it's like saying well females can't be too emotional just stop being emotional whereas they don't class anger or frustration as an emotion and leaders um, have been doing that for years. Male leaders yeah. have been doing that for years. So this is where I feel like we, maybe this topic is obsolete. Maybe we shouldn't be talking about imposter syndrome because are we enhancing this topic and this, this um, these two words? Are we giving it life? Yeah. yeah. Are we enabling it? Yeah. Possibly. Possibly. I mean, if I didn't know the word or the term, and it's only in the last maybe five years I've been hearing it, mm. but that's just me. Maybe I've only only just been hearing it. Look, up until then, I would have said that I I, I would possibly think I wasn't qualified enough for something, and then I would say do something about that. You know, get the qualifications or get the experience that allows you to feel comfortable to apply if in a role for a role or perform in a role um where else do we feel imposter syndrome do you think it's mainly like in leadership roles or in workplace roles I was literally gonna say something along those lines it's like you read I, my mind because I, did. <laughs> I remember when I was actually um doing a workout and I had a podcast in my ear and I can't remember mm-hmm. who it was but they were obviously um, talking about imposter syndrome, but they were talking about imposter syndrome in leaders. So, you know, earlier when I said it's almost like a humble brag, well, the thing Mm -hmm. is, and the thing that stayed with me on that podcast was Anthony Hopkins had actually said, even decades after he was phenomenally famous and rewarded Mm -hmm. as an actor, well, he he had said, even now I get imposter syndrome. And, And you think, oh, well, a person of his stature and his accolade and his reward and his talent and experience where you think, oh, well, maybe I should, you know, feel like I'm in it. Yeah. Because then you're kind of striving for that a little bit more. So I'm just thinking, wait a second, have leaders, and, and I'm talking about leaders back then, yes. it would have been men. So they yes. are creating this narrative. And even if they did feel it, why do we need to adopt that feeling? We don't. Exactly. We don't. Yeah. Yeah. So why would Anthony Hopkins have said he felt imposter syndrome? Because he didn't feel like he could take on the role, the acting role he was placed in. Perhaps. And he obviously can. Okay. He's proven himself in lots of roles and he probably has won awards. I don't know. Yeah. Probably. Many, um, many. Probably. I mean, I know his name and he was in Silence of the Lambs. That's who I'm thinking of, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yes, he's a very, very good actor and I don't know why he would have said that unless, like you say, humble brag. Um, but do we just follow along with it because we feel we should, because it's too arrogant? What was that Taylor Swift you um, post you put up? Because that was really good at saying... Um, the words that are used for women are, you know, um, compared to the words that are used for men, but for the same action. So men react, women overreact. Yeah. Can you remember the others? I cannot, uh, but it is so good. Yeah. So if anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to watch that video, it is on my fitness chicks Instagram channel. So make sure you go over to Instagram and that is really good. Is on yeah. There. yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved that. And and I think that she was more pronouncing that 
the thing is, it's the type of what am I trying to say? It's it's the way we are being interpreted. Yes. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. And it's like, it's not fair because it could be the same thing, but the way we are being described in comparison to men is, is like I said, well, leaders are associated with male characteristics, but for a woman, it's deemed as those microaggressions, right? Yeah. Are they arrogant or, you know? Is it persistence or is it arrogance? I think that was one of them, something like that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, the, it's a terrible word. Well, I perceive it as I don't want to be called arrogant. No. Some people might find that a compliment. I don't mind if they do. It's just not one of the values I want to be associated with. Yeah. I don't want people to be arrogant. But they can call me persistent. And maybe that's where that humble bride comes in. Like I remember even as a young coach, being told be humble I know I and know it's yeah. I've never been told I'm overly confident or arrogant or um, pushy or anything like that and, and and anything that I want to associate with not being humble but as soon as yeah. I said that to one of my friends I think it was you Cal it said a couple of years ago I was like who said that because there's no way that you wouldn't have been that way you wouldn't have mm. been humble and I was mm. like, I took it personally because as I would have back then of everything I'm taking personally, even if it wasn't associated with me, I'm like, oh, I need to do better. And, and you know, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, yeah, maybe I should be more humble because it's coming from a person of higher stature, higher coaching position. And I'm just like, wait a second, why am I following this idiot? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, if it was coming from someone higher, it's also their way of going, like, pull your head in because you're actually doing you know, you're maybe threatening my or making me feel threatened. So pop your head down again, my girl. Or or it could be a man. They might say it to a man, but, you know, I'd be a bit oh more humble. Goodness. Feeling threatened, and I feel like sometimes it goes back to that playing small that you mentioned right at the beginning, Cal. It's don't feel like you need to fit into a box. Don't feel like you need to fit into a certain club or a group around you. And this goes for males and females and who are, however you differentiate yourself. But mm -hmm. it's saying, take up space, like speak up for what you want and actually um, know who you are first. Because when you know who you are, the imposter syndrome isn't there. Right. Because and this goes back to... Yes, that's right. And and I think this really ties in very well with what we spoke about last podcast about your actions being congruent with your values. So, yeah, when you know your values, your action, it's a really easy decision to go, if I act humble or humble my, not act humble, but humble myself, mm. uh, which are different, slightly different, but, yeah, different things. If I humble myself, is that acting is that taking me closer to one of my values or further away? No, one way, no way, I don't know. So, yeah, it makes the decisions on how you act, how you speak, how you do, how you don't, uh, really easy. I completely yeah. agree with you on that one. And I love the way that's kind of all aligned with what we were speaking about a couple of casts ago. But the funny thing is, is let's move to that self-critical voice. So if we're looking mm. at imposter syndrome and that's in our own head, as you said, you had it in this coaching environment of people are sending you CVs because they feel like you are worthy of this role, if not you, yeah. you. But the thing is, there's other people who see your qualities. They see your experience. They see the vastness of you. What Yet you're looking at yourself probably in a mirror that needs to be cleaned and you're like, it's a little bit hazy. I can't completely see all the details of myself, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so you're thinking, yeah. okay, well, maybe, yes, I have imposter syndrome because it's a humble brag, or I've been told I need to do this, um, and they're not aligning with your values. But that's stemming to, well, that's stemming from that self-critical voice. So For sure. if we are being... I, 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 again, it comes back to that humble brag again, because it's like, oh, I'm my own worst critic. Have you heard that? Everybody says, oh, I'm my own worst critic. Yeah, get in line. Everybody is their own worst critic. Of course Everyone is. 
Yeah. But why do people have to feel that they need to tell other people that they have imposter syndrome? That they, <laughs> that they. I'll tell you know. why. Okay, so this is my opinion. And uh, I did hear during the week uh, on an Adam Grant podcast, he said, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Uh, but if you sprout your opinion, then you are now um, really having to um, change your opinion if better logic or better science or better research comes up that shows your opinion is wrong. So here I am saying my opinion right here, right now, um, and that could change, okay? But based on my experience, people will say I'm my own worst critic and tell you their flaws so that they've said it first. Does that make sense? So you can't now go and say, hey, um, Kelly's got a pimple on her nose because I told you this morning that I've already got it there and I'm aware of it. And so your the value of what you're saying is diminished. I'll say it again because you're looking very confused. I've baffled you. So if I say I am, I have terrible handwriting, okay, and then I send you a letter and you go, that's like unreadable, I can't, and then you will tell my mum, Kelly's got terrible handwriting and, mom will go, and my mum will say, oh, she knows. She tells everyone. Okay, so the value of what you are saying is now diminished. I so, get what you're saying. I get I get the example, but my question is why? So if you are willing to put your flaws and your weaknesses out there in advance, mm-hmm. what is the purpose of that? Uh, I'm I well, firstly, I think we only see our flaws. Well, we firstly see our flaws before we see our own value. When you get asked to write down five things you do well and five things you do poorly, you probably start with the poorly column first because you know them better than the things you do well. Oh, that's interesting. I would have done that easily a couple of years ago, but I feel like I was going to say, this is different for you. (laughs) This is why this podcast should be about you because this is what we're talking about was you and how we should be is you. Yeah, And so many of the things I was reading about this week and, and trying to polish our bit of knowledge and understanding about what we're going to talk about, I'm like, I should just direct the questions back to Tulsa every single time because a few years ago that was you. And, and then all you've got to say, all you've got to describe is what you've done in the last year, two years. It's only been one year, hasn't it? Well, three years since like I think the experience has evolved to where I am now but also it's like 10 15 37 years in the making right sure 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 but also it's in the book so when I get my ass into gear <laughs> everything is clear in the book <laughs> yeah good as it needs to be yeah so yes yeah, so you're right that would have been you a few years ago you would have sort of introduced yourself and your flaws to someone, a potential partner, you would have introduced your flaws to them. And I think most people do introduce themselves via their flaws so that they're already out there. They're, it's not something that is hidden. It's, it's, it's so when people discover them, it's kind of like, yeah, I, I know, I told you first. Okay. Right. That's really interesting. So I, you know me and I like my little data. So I was looking at an article and actually it was um, a piece from a radio show. Mm -hmm. And during that radio show, there was a conversation about all the media station um, attention on terrorism. Right. And the fear that we as a nation, as countries that we're feeling about the tax of 9-11. So it's way back when, like over 20 years ago. But he had ended her introduction by saying, but what if the worst enemy we face is the one residing inside ourselves, the critical inner voice? Now you're looking at terrorism, right? And now this introduction saying... The worst enemy that we face resides inside ourselves. So the thing is, like, I'm going back to the things that we 
take in the things that we think, the things that we say to ourselves, we wouldn't dream of speaking that way to a friend or someone we love. Oh, we wouldn't yeah. dream of doing that. No, you would There's no. this negative, there's this pessimistic, there's that you've got the negative pessimistic uh, side of your head, but then also you've got the soothing and loving and affectionate side of yourself, right? But then that can be quite destructive too. So it's almost like that that soothing and supportive um, voice would go, oh, we'll just have another piece of cake or drink the rest of that wine in that bottle. And that's the, in, in the critical voice going, oh, let's just self-sabotage. Or, you know, it's not going to be, you can't see the effects of it now. You can't see the effects of what you eat or, or how you exercise now, but in three, four, 12 weeks, you will. And I had this thought the other day, I was walking the other day and I thought to myself, the decisions we make now, if everybody was aware that the decisions they make right now would be congruent, would it be, um, it would come, uh, maybe I'm using that term wrong. It would be, yeah, the decisions we're making now would be incongruent to what had been, what had happened in the future, right? That's right. Yes. It, yes. Yes, to your goals, incongruent to your goals. So well, basically they would, um, now I've lost my word, but they, they're the reverse of your goal. Yeah. So if we and, were to say that decision we make or that, you know, the decision we take to exercise or the decision we take to not eat that extra piece of cake, that in four, five, 12 weeks time, we're going to be a better version of ourselves. We're going to look better. We're going to feel better. We're going to have more energy, but nobody Mm -hmm. thinks like that, but also it's that self-critical voice because it's unable to move past the instant gratification, the instant reward, probably that, um, the thing that needs to catch our attention quickly, or we think we'll we'll have this cake now because it won't be there tomorrow. Yeah. So yes, absolutely. And so that makes me think there needs to be an alternate reward for not having the cake. Because if it's just your reward system that needs that, you know, that little hit of adrenaline, is it adrenaline that it would, I guess so, the little adrenaline hit, then there must be some other, like, um, you can get an adrenaline hit from um, doing burpees. <laughs> I'm joking. It's not a reward to do burpees. Um, <laughs> but not having cake. So having the cake is an instant reward but a far away non-reward what am I trying to say straight away you would get your little adrenaline hit from it but you would get even like a degree of depression three weeks later five weeks later like say 12 weeks later if you kept um, rewarding yourself with cake then you know there's the anti-reward so if it's just that little adrenaline hit that we're after by eating the cake, what would be your alternate reward? What would I, for you personally? This is the thing that you need to go back and find the bigger picture, right? So this is where, when I, when we're getting the course up and running for the female leadership formula, it's, it's, it's a female, it's a, it's derived and it's targeted towards high performing Uh, leaders but I've created this leadership formula but within that it basically Mm -hmm. looks at um, people who have lost their drive who've lost their purpose Mm -hmm. because they're stuck in this cycle it's hard to break out of it right Mm -hmm. we were talking about this a couple of podcasts ago you're overwhelmed you're stressed you're anxious there's a list full um and you're up to your eyeballs on tasks to do and you can't differentiate between what is actually required what is a necessity and things that maybe aren't as important but still need to get done so in terms of the priority list is a bit disorientated but the thing is there is no goal there is no vision when you end up losing your vision you end up down this self-destructive path and you end up taking those self-sabotage, your self-critical voice of becoming more prominent, it's always residing within you, but Mm. then you end up, you know, feeling more anxious and burnt out because you've lost your lighthouse. In amongst the fog, you can only see what is here right now within maybe a foot or two, but the lighthouse is gone. But the thing is, when 
if I take this back to the self-critical voice um, topic, it's mm -hmm. while not all of those thoughts are critical, they are all still self-destructive and the sabotage are real goals and wants. So that prevents us from finding the meaning of life. So if you end up keep on this bandwagon of, you know, the imposter syndrome or self-critical voice or having these poor decisions in regard to your health and well-being and your mental resilience and all these things that can help you reach the goal well you're never going to yeah. get there because you can't see it in sight right and that's where people right. end up with that haze and that fog and that anxiety and everything like that does that make sense <laughs> totally it's a really good analogy actually and all the words that come along with that decision fatigue that you get yourself into like brain fog it all goes hand in hand with that analogy and not being able to see more than a metre in front of you and all that's in front of you is tiredness, cake, <laughs> you know, and, and just being just the tiredness, I think, and the exhaustion. Toss yeah. that so much stems from being tired, borderline exhausted. Uh, I think that's probably the first thing to address when you when you are overwhelmingly self-critical and overwhelmingly self-sabotaging the, the person you want to be or the, the goals you want to achieve. Uh, I think sleep's got to be one of the first. Sleep and nutrition got to be some of the first things that are addressed, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And this is the thing when, when I came up with the Elevate Success Leadership Formula, for me, I was like, okay, so what is the critical stage right now? You know, what is the way to overcome exhaustion, erase anxiety and thrive in relationships? Because actually it's that one step that you can't possibly put more burdens and more tasks on you, but that's one thing that you're not doing to get that opportunity you know, to get that raise, to get that um, contract that you need, because you can't possibly add more things in without taking things out. So it's that defining the drive in that first stage that I, I lead um, the high professional women through is how do you raise your self-esteem? How do you incorporate guilt-free self-care? Stop playing small, regain that inner confidence. So you can then redefine your goals and turn those dreams into reality. And that's, that's, that's something that I'm really, really passionate about because I've been through it. And Kelly, yourself too, when we were talking about exhaustion, like all these voices in our head are so normal, but we end up suppressing them. But I feel like going back to when I say you've got the self-critical voice, but it's also soothing and it kind of like leads you into false pretenses, like I have having that case. Uh, yeah. But I yeah, think that's right. It's, I feel like for me, uh, it was it was constantly self-critical and for some reason I can't put a pinpoint time frame on it for some reason it shifted and then there was a soothing voice but a really kind loving affectionate voice and I can't figure out when that happened but what I realized over the past three years especially doing meditation and mindfulness practices that I, I also coach is um the self-critical voice is really loud and aggressive and the inner soothing calm loving aspect is really quiet so when your head is brimming with thoughts when there's chaos around you when there's deadlines that you feel like you're chasing the only way to find the compassionate version of you the the version that is so strong so competent so knowledgeable so experienced so loving yes she's in you yes. she speaks so friggin quietly that you really need to slow down to listen to her there you go you just said that so beautifully one thing I do want to ask Tulsa because you seem to have uh well, overcome is probably not the right word but let's say overcome this is that Instead of hearing these voices or, you know, you, the self-critical voice, and we, we're speaking about it as though you do say it to yourself. You don't really. It's more like an automatic action to eat that cake. You don't go, you're a pig, so eat it anyway. Like you do, <laughs> And that was really harsh. But you know what I mean. <laughs> you don't say that to yourself and then eat it anyway. It's more of an automatic reaction and then a, a, a follow-up of guilt. Okay? You've nurtured then, that. You've nurtured that over time, right? You've nurtured that self-critical voice. 
So you're saying that self-critical voice is quietened by eating the cake for momentarily? Yeah, 100%. Okay. But then also on the flip side of things, you're so busy and the, there's so much noise around you that you're not listening to the person who really wants to take care of you, who's saying probably eat a salad. Like that's, that voice is like suppressed so far down that that mm-hmm. self-critical voice is actually quite prominent and loud. And because we nurture those thoughts, this is not easy. This is not for people who are listening and they're thinking, oh, I've still got a self-critical voice or I hear this all the time. It takes work. It takes effort to then go, right, I'm going to change my mindset because this pathway that you've walked for years, right, it's ingrained. You've now forged this now terrain that is clear. But this new terrain, which is a little bit bushy, like it's got lots of overgrown weeds and grass, you're going to have to form a new pathway. And that's where the kinder, compassionate version of you resides but it's going to take work, right? You're going to take a few more routes back and forth until you can start to make a dent in that, um, in the grass. I can think of so many cliche sayings, good old fashioned, like hundreds of years old sayings that relate to that. Um, And so it, it also makes me think that this kind of thinking, this kind of poor patterning is, eons old it's a human thing it's not necessarily a female thing it's not a male thing it's a human thing yeah. and it's it, it like suppression can be it can happen to populations of people it can happen to you know countries full of people and yet you can do it to yourself as well you know you can so if you imagine suppression of a whole country or a whole group of people but that same thing is happening within this little body, you know, and this little brain, it, that same overwhelming feeling of being pushed down. You don't have a voice. You don't have, um, you don't have the, the power to do anything about it. And you're doing that to yourself. You're, yeah, you're acting. You're not even telling yourself that you're just acting as if that's true. It's a lack of awareness because you're so used to going down that route mentally. You've now Mm -hmm. formed these strong neural connections, which means that that is your go-to, right? It's almost like saying, what is your morning routine, right? You tend not to think about it because it's a habit formation. So then to to ingrain a new habit in that routine is going to take some time and effort and awareness, And it's the same with your own thoughts. So if you have ingrained these thoughts that have become habitual in your mindset, how do you first raise awareness? Forget about changing. How do you first raise awareness to that issue? And then you start to pivot those thoughts into another direction. But it's funny you say that it is a human issue. I completely agree with you, Cal, on that one. But talking about self-sabotage, like we've talked about imposter syndrome, we've talked about that self-critical voice and something that everybody has and are probably experienced is procrastination, right? Everybody has some sort of procrastination and that is a direct self-sabotage. Yes. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. And so think of the last time you procrastinated on something and hence self-sabotaged yourself. Why did you procrastinate? What was it? What did you procrastinate on? Mm, I feel I there's probably two examples for me. Um, one of them will probably be the editing of podcasts. I usually put those things off because it they do take a lot of time. Yep. Um, but then... And now that I've carved out some time in my diary to say, right, do it on this date or this afternoon, usually I block quite a lot of time. And what I've Mm -hmm. noticed recently is the time has shortened. So obviously the experience, the routine, the enjoying the process of editing rather than mm-hmm. waiting for the end result, because we know what the end result is, right? It's a finely tuned, something that people can listen to and great, you can just press play and go. But the thing is, it does take time to collate all of that information and dissect it down to make it more seamless. So 
whilst you're in that transitional phase, I think that transitional phase of, oh, do I have to do this? And I, and I need to get to the end goal. So another example that I find quite, um, is probably an easier or better example that more people can relate to if you own your own business or you're an entrepreneur or is doing taxes. Like if you're lucky enough to get an accountant, fantastic. But I remember the early years of starting my business and I would put it off. Like, I don't want to do the receipts. I don't want to write stuff down. I don't know how to collect things together. And then you have to do it online. And oh my goodness, like even if it was in my diary, I'd move it to the next day or I'd move it to the next week. Or I'm like, oh, let me just push it closer to the deadline. It's because you're trying, you're in my head. I feel it's worse thinking about it than actually doing it and the thing is somebody said it's a little bit morbid but I'm going to use it anyway somebody somebody did say procrastination is the cancer of progress and it is morbid so if I've triggered anybody I'm really really sorry (laughs) please forgive me you might have triggered a few actually you've triggered me I'm sorry but this is the thing it's like this if, unless there's no urgency you're not going to do it unless there's no goal then you're not going to do it and people who think oh you've got six months to do this oh that's all right then I've got six months I'm just going to sit back and do some other stuff <laughs> that's me that's absolutely me and I used to say and maybe it's still it's true maybe it is I procrastinate because I do my best work under pressure but this is not just a pretty cool thing to say right I don't even know if it's true I probably would have done a whole lot better work if I've started six months out. Yeah. It's just that the work I put out under a deadline was good enough for, for you know, to pass or to whatever. Yeah. But our friend, our mutual friend, Nikolai Morris, submits everything early. She's that person. And her, her work is brilliant, really good work. So she, she put, puts her own deadline I guess but her own pressure on herself to to do it and so she doesn't procrastinate but still gets out really she really does pull out quality work Nick does but so what I'm saying is I wait till the literal deadline like the government's deadline as do you (laughs) before we do our menial work or even our best work you know the taxes or the presentation yeah, but and I'm trying to stop that. I swear. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think anyone really finds taxes fun, and if you do, oh, bless you, someone's got to. Anyway, <laughs> but I'm the same. I will procrastinate or put things off, but not. You like yours is a really valid reason. It, you don't. You don't want to do it. You just don't want to do it. So those two examples you gave were just because I don't want to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. But for me, I have to find, I have to be sparked with interest to do it. So it's not as though I'm putting it off. I just don't, I guess I just don't want to. But the reason is because I'm I'm not learning. I'm not, and so my interest isn't there because I'm not learning. At the moment, I'm learning something. I'll tell you about it another time. But, um, oh, my interest is so by it I love it which is something that I like doing I like learning things quickly or being able to or learning something being able to implement part of it but I have to do a hell of a lot of work before I can implement any of it and that is not like me to want to do something like that but oh my gosh I am and I'm loving it so um, I'm not putting it off only because I'm learning and it interests me so for procrastination, do you think not not wanting to do it and on the flip side, having an interest in it or learning? And what else? What else would make you want to do something now? I feel right like now. you made a really good point there. It's, it's a case of we all have the capacity to procrastinate, but the task has to have an end goal. Like going back to that value, we're like we're going to action take if it's aligned with our value, right? Or yes. the end goal. So even though I used to procrastinate with taxes, what I've done over the years is when I've gotten used to doing them, every time I have this feeling of going, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. It's so time consuming. And when I did do it, it wasn't as time consuming. And, and going back to that podcast I did is 
making sure that that wiring in my brain is going, I'm going to give myself this chunk of time to do it. And every time I did it, I narrowed the time it took, which meant in my diary, I can physically see I've saved time in my diary. Right. And so having that new neural pathway to say to myself, it's not as bad as it seemed. I've over hyped it in my head and just just get it done and that's the thing it's just taking that first step so I feel like I've shifted from that procrastination mindset but also Mm -hmm. I found something really interesting that yeah when you do have that match between something that makes you curious that gets you learning it has to pique your interest enough to stop you procrastinating watching YouTube watching TikTok you're right because that is a a form of procrastination because what you're doing is you're looking for instant gratification versus Mm -hmm. that long term so what I'm saying is okay so our deadline is six months or your tax is due at this point or it's going to take you this long but right now oh this is so satisfying watching a kitten on YouTube or a TikTok video right yeah so that I get it. is the battle that we're trying to use in our heads. But this is a really interesting one. And this is my final fact for the podcast, I promise. <laughs> but <laughs> with, with us, there was a survey that basically said that 20% of Americans are chronic procrastinators. And that study after study showed that chronic procrastination isn't laziness and poor time management. As a lot of people are like, oh, you're just being lazy or, you know, you're watching videos on YouTube, but it's actually a byproduct of negative emotions such as guilt, anxiety, depression, low self-worth, which is really different to the contrary belief. So procrastinators are actually threatened by the complexity of the work that gives them the anxiety. And that's where the armadillo actually comes and tells us to find pleasure in other activities. So then I know you said you thrive well under pressure, Cal, but actually. Yeah, but I don't. I, yeah. I actually found not something necessarily. that stimulated you that yep. bypasses procrastination. Yeah. I'm going to hang on to that one. I love that one. That, that you know, it's um, what actually makes you procrastinate is a fear or the, or the anxiety or, yeah. And That's I could. What? I could attach those labels to every feeling I have before actually knuckling down and doing something. Yeah, absolutely. I had that thought of why am I delaying taxes? Because I feel like it's going to take a long time. But if I did it, it doesn't take. And then it was the rewiring of actually doing it and then not taking that much time as now I'm enjoying the task, just like the editing. It doesn't bother me now. I'm actually enjoying doing it because I'm, I'm enjoying the process of it. And, and so it's taking that fear or the guilt or the negative emotions out. But you, again, it goes back to that self-critical voice. You need to take the awareness of what's actually happening. What, what are you processing in order to then go, okay, what's the long-term vision? What's the goal? What do I need to get there? What if everything you do, should, will you say, this is aligning with this goal, this value? Goals and values, they, they align eventually anyway. So doing your taxes aligns with the goal of, you tell me, or the value of Tulsi's value of, you tell me, being organised. That is definitely a Tulsi value, being organised. So doing your taxes fills the little peg hole of, I have um, done that today. I have organized myself today and now I can feel good about that Mm -hmm. so do you think maybe we should attach one of our values to something that causes anxiety depression panic (laughs) and procrastination ultimately so if you could draw a little line between your organizational skills that give you such pleasure I do believe am I right yeah yeah. I love it so if you have the highlights Love taking them. Absolutely. You're one of those people who's got a drawer full of highlighters and uh, little post-it notes, aren't you? There you go. <laughs> Look at my notes. Like We're not even in the same country. I really couldn't have known that except that I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I know my tolls. Um, but, yeah, if you could have a little peg in the board here with your values 
and a little pegboard here with all the things you have to do but don't want to do. And if you could go, this little one is tied with a rope or a string to this one, and so you peg it in and it pegs in there. Do you think that would, and it, I think it would for me, because I, I, I would probably like popping the little pegs in the holes, to be honest, but there you go. There's There's my value. You know, I've achieved it. I've done it. I've ticked it off for today at least. And I should feel good about that. Okay, so, so maybe another thing, I love the yeah. way you said that, but also if we end up doing that task for ourselves of saying we're aligning our values with what we need to do, what do we need to delegate? Because we really don't feel oh. it values our time. Exactly what I was going to say. Letting next. it go, right? Yeah. If none of these things you have to do aligns with one of these five things, delegate it let it go yeah for sure yeah that's a good roundup of you know it's a good point to end isn't it so let it is a good point to end for sure well thank you so much thank you so much for just uh I loved this conversation today Cal we explored so many different areas of self-sabotage and we've got one more podcast left of this particular series. So mm-hmm. then our next one, we'll be talking about how to stay in your comfort zone versus what's healthier for you and what's better for you. But just before we go, um, just a quick reminder that um, I have this new program out called Elevate Your Success, and it is a three-stage leadership formula. So for those who are interested, the whole purpose of this program is I transform executives and professional women who are in high pressure roles and those who are suffering from overwhelm, stress, burnout, so they can elevate their own success in their own field. And that's personally and professionally, so they can become powerful agents of change. And lastly, if you're not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, click that subscribe button. That would be very much appreciated. And uh, Kelly and I will see you on the next one, right, Kel? You will. We'll be here. Thanks, Tulse. Thanks, Cal.